Welcome to the screencast, Perfect Punctuation. This is part two of four, the comma, dash, and parentheses. Here are the learning outcomes for part two. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to understand how to use commas, dashes, and parentheses in your writing, and know how to edit your writing for accuracy in comma use. And here's what we're going to do in this screencast. We'll review seven rules for comma use. As we review these rules, we'll explain comma, common comma errors associated with each rule. And finally, we'll explain the difference between commas, dashes, and parentheses. So comma rule number one, use a comma and one of the fanboys or coordinating conjunctions to join two independent clauses. The fanboys are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. And you'll see then that fanboys is a mnemonic for these coordinating conjunctions. And there are only seven of them in the English language. So here's an example of sentences using a fanboy, a comma, and a fanboy to join two independent clauses. Laura went to a lecture last night on the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, and she found the talk distressing. So here we have one independent clause. Laura went to a lecture last night on the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, and we have the second independent clause, she found the talk distressing. We have the comma and the fanboy linking these two independent clauses, so forming a compound sentence. If you, if you um, don't understand this terminology, independent clause, fanboy, compound sentence, I suggest you review um, the first presentation in um, the perfect punctuation series, because in this first presentation, I go over these terms, I explain them. Here's the second example. Large parts of the reef have died because of global warming, but many people feel powerless to change the situation. So our first, our independent clause, our first one here, large parts of the reef have died because of global warming, then our comma and our fanboy, and our second independent clause. Many people feel powerless to change the situation. So a common error that students often make when trying to apply rule number one is using a comma alone, but no fanboy to join two independent clauses. This is known as a comma splice, and it is a serious grammatical error. So here's an example of a comma splice. Last summer, we went to the Rogers Cup in Toronto. We saw some great matches. So you have one independent clause here. Last summer, we went to the Rogers Cup in Toronto. And then you have another one here. We saw some great matches. So you cannot join two independent clauses with a comma or you have a comma splice. You have to use a fanboy uh, with the comma. Here's the correction. With Last summer, we went to the Rogers Cup in Toronto, comma, and we saw some great matches. Then you have a perfectly punctuated sentence. So another a problem, another error that students make when trying to apply comma rule number one is using a comma before a fanboy when they have only one subject and one independent clause. So in the incorrect example I'm going to show you, there's only one subject and the subject is Aaron and Joel. And um, you'll see that there's no subject before but in the sentence. So, so there should be no comma in front of it. Okay, so let's have a look here. Um, you, you have to look at it to understand what I mean. Aaron and Joel tried hard to figure out the math problem, but gave up in the end. So here we have the subject, Aaron and Joel. Tried is the verb. Hard to figure out the math problem. And we have, the com uh, we have a comma here and but. But you see, we do not have a second subject. So because we do not have a second subject, we should not have a comma. So let's have a look at how you repair that. 
Aaron and Joel tried hard to figure out the math problem, but gave up in the end. They just take out the comma. Another way that you could fix this problem is by uh, adding a second subject. Aaron and Joel tried hard to figure out the math problem, but they gave up in the end. So in this case, you add, you're add, you going to add the comma and but, you're going to have the comma and but, and, and then you're going to add the subject. So you have a choice how you're going to fix this, this problem. Two ways to do it. Uh, one is to just take out the comma. The other is to leave in the comma and the fanboy, um, but add the second subject. Um, another common error that students make when trying to apply rule number one is omitting the comma when using a fanboy to join two clauses. So here's an example. Saskatchewan's economy did not suffer during the 2008 global recession, but it has not escaped the world decline in oil prices. And here's the correction. Saskatchewan's economy did not suffer during the 2008 global recession, but it has not escaped the world decline in oil prices. So you see the difference. The only difference here is the addition of the comma, and this makes the sentence correct because you have two independent clauses, one on either side of the but. And if you have two independent clauses and you join them with a coordinating conjunction or one of the fanboys, then you have to proceed the coordinating conjunction with a comma. Okay, moving on to comma rule number two. Use commas to set off adverbs and phrases in the middle or at the end of an independent clause, with therefore as an exception. Here's what I mean. Here's an example. Cheaper tickets were available. We decided, however, to buy the box seats. Okay, so we're inserting an adverb here in the middle of the sentence. So we need to have commas around that adverb. Uh, cheaper tickets were available. We decided to buy the box seats, however. So if your adverb comes at the end of the sentence, then you obviously need only one comma before it. And here's an example with therefore we don't need to put in the commas, but it wouldn't be wrong to do so. A trip to Wimbledon to see tennis would have been too expensive. We therefore decided to go to Toronto instead. So a common error with uh, rule number two is just not putting the commas in around the adverbs. So to write something like I was, however, relieved to find that good seats were still available for the Rogers Cup. You need to correct that by putting in commas around however. Now let's move on to comma rule number three. This is insert a comma after introductory words, phrases, and dependent clauses that precede the subject. Here are three examples. Running across the Broadway Bridge, Anne felt a sharp pain in her ankle. And we have the comma. When she looked at her ankle, she saw that it was swollen. Comma again. Because she couldn't run any further, she turned around and limped back home. So this is a phrase running across the Broadway Bridge. This is a dependent clause when she looked at her ankle, and this is another dependent clause. So you have to have commas in front, or sorry, commas after those dependent clauses. There is an exception to this rule. That is when you have very short phrases, you can omit the comma. Uh, when the short phrase appears at the beginning of the sentence. But you must put the comma in after interjections such as in fact and indeed. And you also need to include commas after most adverbs and adverb phrases. So here are the examples. In 1999, my daughter was born. The comma, a comma here is optional. In the end, we decided to stay. Again, optional comma here. But when you have in fact, you have to put the comma in. In fact, the situation has worsened. And when you have an adverb phrase, same thing. On the other hand, comma, we could stay in Saskatoon for another two years. The thing is, when you decide to omit commas from short, very short phrases that come at the beginning of a sentence, you need to be consistent. So if you um, you don't want to, to, to go back and forth, sometimes putting in the comma, and sometimes not. Another uh, co common error with comma rule number three is inserting a comma in front of a subordinate conjunction when the dependent clause follows the main clause. So exceptions are which, 
while, whereas, although, and as. So there are these exceptions, these subordinate conjunctions, um, and you can put commas in front of these subordinate conjunctions, but not um, before the others. So, for example, you're not going to say white pelicans are often seen at the Saskatoon Weir because they are attracted to the abundant fish found in the swirling waters. You're not going to put a comma before because. Uh, putting a comma before because is really very seldom correct. So to fix the error, you're just going to take out the comma before because. Another problem that you see sometimes when people are trying to apply this rule is you'll see them inserting a period or a semicolon after a dependent clause, creating a sentence fragment. And a sentence fragment is a serious error, much like a comma splice. So you don't want to have sentence fragments in your writing. So this is incorrect. Though Sarah liked living in Saskatoon, she missed her family. You, you fix this error by replacing the semicolon with a comma, and then you have perfect punctuation. Moving on to common rule number four, use commas to set off non-essential phrases and clauses. So phrases and clauses that are not essential to the meaning of the sentence. And don't use commas around essential phrases and clauses. Related to this rule is um, the idea of using which to begin non-essential clauses and that to begin essential clauses. Who, the word who, can be used with both. Let me show you what I mean. Gina's house, which has a new roof, is near the university. So in the context of this sentence, which has a new roof, really hasn't much to do with the location of Gina's house. So you could consider this a non-essential phrase. Um, in the next one, however, who left early uh, is not surrounded with commas because it is an essential phrase. We need that phrase to understand the meaning of the sentence. The students who left early avoided getting soaked in the heavy rain. So that's essential because it was only the students who left early who didn't get soaked. So therefore, we need, uh, no, there should be no commas uh, surrounding this clause. Next one, the subway car that had a brake problem was taken out of service. Again, um, this clause that had a brake problem is essential to the meaning of the sentence because without it we wouldn't know which subway car is being identified. So therefore we need this clause and so there are no commas surrounding it. And another thing is, notice that we're using that because this is an essential clause, whereas here we've used which because it's not essential to the meaning of the sentence. So here are some problems that students have, some errors that they make when they're trying to apply this comma rule. Um, just omitting commas around non-essential clauses and putting them around essential clauses, and then using that when they should use which and vice versa. Here's an example of, a, of an error. Because he was ill, Lynn missed his evening class that he had been attending since January. Well, I would suggest that this part, that, this, that he had been attending since January, isn't really essential to the meaning of the sentence. So it should not have that. It should have a comma. It should be introduced, this clause, with a comma and which, rather than that, with no comma. So this is the correct correction. Because he was ill... Lynn missed his evening class, which he had been attending since January. The next one, see the error here. The first-year students who Amy saw at the writing center yesterday had many writing problems. This um, clause, who Amy saw at the writing center, should not be surrounded by commas because it is essential to the meaning of the sentence because it identifies those first-year students. Only the ones who Amy saw at the writing center yesterday had the writing problems. So with this clause, you do not put commas around it because it's essential to identifying the first-year students and so to the meaning of the sentence. Comma rule number five. Um, and this is about using commas between three or more words, phrases, or clauses in a series. And whether or not you use a final comma before and is optional. 
And so this is known, this comma, this final comma is known as the serial comma or sometimes as the Oxford comma. So in, the, in um, these examples, I've used the serial comma in each sentence. Keith bought milk, bread, and eggs, and eggs at the store. You could eliminate this comma, omit it if you wanted to. The Canadian government consists of the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary. So uh, again, I've used the serial comma. The violinist played the sonata, the judges adjudicated it, and the audience waited for the mark to be posted. These, this is actually a, a collection of independent clauses separated by commas. So let's look at the errors students make when they um, use commas to separate items in a series. Uh, and this series can be clauses, subjects, verbs, and objects. When there are not three items, when there are two items, this is the main problem students have. They uh, we use uh, using commas to separate only two items. You use the serial comma when you have three or more items. So let's look at the, what happens when you make that mistake. The violinist played a solo. The judges adjudicated it. Right away, you have a comma splice here. Um, you have two independent clauses, so you cannot join two independent clauses with a comma. How do you fix it? Well, you put in a fanboy. The violinist played a solo, comma, and the judges adjudicated it. Now the sentence is perfect. Another mistake is inserting a comma between, say, two subjects, two objects. Here's an example with two subjects. The violinist and the cellist played a duet. This is incorrect, having a comma here. So you just remove it. The violinist and the cellist played a duet. OK, we're at comma rule number six. Use commas to separate coordinate adjectives, but no commas to separate cumulative adjectives. Coordinate adjectives are almost like partners in a sentence, whereas cumulative adjectives build on one another. You have to have one before the other. So um, how do you decide uh, whether or not you need to put a comma between your adjectives? So you ask yourself these questions. Can I put and between the adjectives? And can I reverse the order of the adjectives? If the answer is yes to both, you know you have coordinate adjectives, therefore you should put commas between the adjectives. Here's an example of coordinating coordinate adjectives. Lynn is a hardworking, ambitious student. So um, there you could put you could um, put these adjectives in a different order. Lynn is an ambitious, hardworking student. You could put and between them. Lynn is a hardworking and ambitious student. Therefore, you know that the Adjectives are a coordinate, so you have to put a comma between them. And I see I missed the period here. Of course, there should be a period here. Uh, then the next sentence, John saw an endanger, endangered white rhinoceros at the zoo. These are cumulative adjectives. You cannot say John saw a white endangered rhinoceros at the zoo. You cannot say John saw a, a white and endangered white rhinoceros at the zoo, so therefore you know these are cumulative and they don't take a comma between them. Well, the last rule, that is to include or exclude a comma to reduce confusion and increase clarity. So in the example we had earlier, I've repeated it here, several prominent people were invited to speak including human rights advocates Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. So in, this is ambiguous. We don't know whether the speaker is meaning that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin are the human rights advocates who have been invited to speak or that they have been invited along with human rights advocates. So, But adding this comma makes it clear that uh, the serial comma makes it clear that um, human rights advocates and Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have been invited to speak. So even if you're perhaps not using that final serial comma, um, if there's any kind of ambiguity, you should put it in. And some people choose to use the serial or Oxford comma because they feel it is, um, it is clearer, it is less ambiguous.
So you want to be consistent with your punctuation use, but you also want to reduce confusion and increase clarity. One last thing. I want to talk a little bit about parentheses and dashes and their relation to commas. And there's actually an excellent website by someone who calls herself Grammar Girl. She calls it, and so it's called Quick and Dirty Tips. Very good. I highly recommend it for really any uh, grammar or punctuation point. But here's what she says about parentheses, commas, and dashes. Parentheses are the quiet whisper of an aside. Commas are the conversational voice of a friend walking by your desk. And dashes are the yowl of a pirate dashing into a fray. You can almost hear the difference there. So parentheses are much quieter. They, you're almost saying to the reader, you can look at what's uh, inserted between the parentheses if you like, but you don't have to. With commas, then you're suggesting that, 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 they should, that your reader should probably wants to look what's at what's inserted between the commas with the dashes you're making a point what you put between the commas so let's listen to the examples and by the way these are my examples not from grammar girl everyone turned to look as the new faculty member wearing a scarlet coat entered the staff room everyone turned to look as the new faculty member wearing a scarlet coat entered the staff room Everyone turned to look as the new faculty member wearing a scarlet coat entered the staff room. So you see the difference here. You use the dash if you want to highlight the information. Use the parentheses if you, if you want to um, give, make it up to the reader whether or not they're going to really uh, consult this uh, information. To sum up, Use a comma and a coordinating conjunction, one of the fanboys, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so, to join two independent clauses. Use a comma to set off conjunctive adverbs, e.g. however, in the middle or at the end of a main clause, to set off introductory words before the subject, to set off non-essential phrases, to set off coordinating adjectives, and to set off items in lists. And remember that dashes have more emphasis than commas, and commas have more emphasis than parentheses. Well, our next presentation is on the semicolon and the colon.